Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! Hello, and thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. I have a special guest today again, my wife Elaine. And Elaine and I were chatting the other day about something that came up on my son's cell phone. What happened? Well, our son is 13, and we were at lunch just yesterday, in fact, and he said, Mom, this is what happens when you search for Minecraft. And he pulled up an ad that popped up on his phone. I'm assuming it was in YouTube because he watches YouTube videos of Minecraft or, you know, Transformers or, you know, very minor things. And we check his search history or have the ability to. And what popped up was an ad for an for a game or an app called Gay Dorado which is evidently a game to play, which is promoting homosexuality. It's promoting all kinds of things along with it. You can see, we of course searched it to see what it was, but even on the ad, he was not able to skip it. You know how some ads you're able to skip? This Mm -hmm. one you couldn't even skip. So it's popping up on our 13 year old's timeline. And it, I mean, besides the point of it being about homosexual relationships, which we don't support homosexual behavior as Christians, that's not what you know, Jesus didn't teach that that was okay. The New Testament doesn't teach that that's okay. So that's beside the point. My extra concern was the sexuality that's being pushed on our children. It's being accepted by society and that it's just so prevalent now in our society that even our son searching up videos for nonsense, for child level things, yeah. is those kinds of things are coming up. So what do you tell parents? And you know, in your ministry, you deal with that a lot. What do you tell parents when they are having subjects broached for them they were not prepared for and maybe don't want to have the conversation about? What do you do? That was one of my thoughts. I began to fume when I first saw it because I thought, thank goodness we talk about these things with our children mm-hmm. because there are so many parents who do not talk about it. And so the children are being taught. And I say children. A child is a child until they're 18. Then they're considered an adult. Teenagers, you know, elementary children, whatever, they're hearing these things in society. They're hearing them overtly at school that we should accept everyone and love everyone. And of course, we should accept and love everyone. But what's being taught, particularly where we live and other places that are more on the left side, um, are that that we should accept the behavior. And a lot of that is sexual behavior. Um, And so that's what's coming up. So one thing I would say was it really concerned me. I thought, I said to my husband, said to David, I'm so thankful that Hayden showed me this. And I said to Hayden himself, I said, baby, we're so proud of you that you Mm -hmm. would tell us that, that you Mm -hmm. would show us this rather than being embarrassed about it. And he wasn't embarrassed. He was just kind of surprised. But he's he had not told me for a while, I guess, not keeping a secret, but He said this has come up multiple times, that it's come up several times, and he's seen the ad. He said, like, this is a different video, Mom. Another one came up. But one thing that I thought of as well was that parents that I know, many of them have dreaded the talk that, you know, the typical bird and the bees talk or whatever Mm -hmm. you want to call it. They've dreaded that or they've said, oh, we just had the talk, and their kid is, you know, 13, 14 years old, Mm -hmm. way past the point of where that should start. And so if they're not even talking about sex sexuality, body part names, all of those kind of things at an early age, your kids are being exposed to it regardless. And I would much rather you expose them to it in a healthy environment where they're able to ask questions and learn the accurate things and accurate names and Mm -hmm. what godly sexuality is rather than learn it from their friends at school or from what they see on YouTube or from the ads that are popping up on their phone. Yeah, it reminds me of something you and I talk about often and many, I mean, a lot of clergy do, and that is the overwhelming amount of inactivity that parents have in training their children. I, I'm, we are, versus myself, we are, and I know we know many other clergy are as well in the churches, we're just bombarded 
by the constant belief amongst parents, implicitly and explicitly, that it's just not their job. And I'm not, I understand to a degree. I mean, parents drop off their children to go to school to learn algebra. They don't learn algebra at home. They might help with homework, but there's always that age where parents go, I'm sorry, honey, I don't have a clue how to do that. But there's a sense we get in a pattern. There's a habit of dropping off our kids to learn things, and then they come home. And then there's, quote, real world or other stuff. and mm-hmm. other. I get it. And that pattern goes through on the seventh day, of course, on su- uh, Sunday. Where they just drop them off and come home and expect that everything basic in life, besides maybe some life skills, are taught by other people. And while I do concur at later stages like chemistry and all kinds of stuff, not to mention some people, some parents don't have the education themselves. Mm-hmm. I think that's okay. That, let me say it this way. I don't think parents have the moral responsibility to make sure their children know algebra and chemistry, physics and cosmology and so forth. I do. I am very convinced. I do think that parents have the moral responsibility to train their children in godliness, mm-hmm. and which means we mm-hmm. have to know what the text says well enough to instruct them. Let me say it a different way. It means that our Christian, our clergy, our Christian workers are not morally responsible for making sure that the children know what they need to know and are modeled what needs to be modeled. So I think these kind of things come up over and over and over in our lives as a constant reminder of the incredible responsibility parents have. Something I'm very proud that Elaine does. She has a blog called Teaching Kids About God. Elaine is very interested in helping equip parents do this very thing. And I very much appreciate that. I feel the same desire for adults to adults. That is equipping adults learn how to take responsibility for their own discipleship. Elaine feels it for helping parents teach children. And I think it's outstanding. We just have a lot of work to do. That's my first big point is that the moral responsibility, I'm convinced on the parents. Now we can look through various Bible verses for that. But through the years when I've said this, most parents immediately start nodding their heads. That most people... (laughs) Most of them do. I mean, some parents maybe, no, it's not my job. It's the youth minister's job. It's the children's mm-hmm. ministry job. That's that's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's just crazy to think that, that all the religious instruction, Christian instruction and more on modeling comes from one person a few hours, maybe at most a week. It's a silly idea. The second thing I'd say is, and I'll come back to your what you do for equipping and so forth. The second thing I'd say is, this is often where parents, particularly mothers, start feeling very guilty. Mothers in particular usually have have mother guilt, and it's much Mm -hmm. more extreme in a woman. Mothers almost always hunt mom guilt. Yeah, usually much worse than it is in fathers. It's just true. Usually because fathers don't feel the same kind of bondingness and responsibility, and uh, usually their self-esteem is usually not gauged by how well they contrast or compare to other mothers. We don't do it with fathers much. Most we just don't have that same, I'd say, problem. I'm sure it's a strength in other areas. (laughs) But having said that, usually, I know, I know I ought to, I know. Well, feeling overwhelmed guilt doesn't save anything. It doesn't help anything. It doesn't redeem anything. So, of course, the first best response is to process. But it might make people feel sad. If you're a Christian parent listening to this now and you realize, man, I've not done a good job at all. Well, that might, you're going to have feelings about that. I would encourage you to process those feelings as a couple, especially if you're married. If you're not married, you're divorced or not married at all, you have children. And you have no one with whom to process it, then process it yourself. Process it with a therapist. If it's that intense, that's fine. Find at least one trusted Christian friend if you can and process those feelings of sadness that you've maybe disappointed yourself or disappointed your children. But secondly, I'd say is then get up and get to work. Children are very resilient and time is not too late. Time is now. Get to work. They need you right now. I often tell parents when they say, where do I start? I say, you start with owning where you failed. Let your parent, let your children see that. Tell them, you know what, I've done a bad job. I've not been modeling proper forgiveness or gracious talk or making church, uh, the body of Christ, a priority in our lives. I let us sleep in all the time or whatever it is, you own it and you tell them it was wrong. And you actually say, I'm sorry for any way that's hurt them. And they, it's okay, daddy or mommy or whatever. Then, I mean, those words are important, but what's most important is then the change behavior. But you start somewhere. You start claiming responsibility. You 
You go to Bible studies. You start learning some Bible here. You read the Bible with your children. I, so I'm going to I'm gonna pause every second. I'm going to do two things. One, any feedback response you have about the need for parents to equip. And secondly, some things you would do to encourage parents if they feel overwhelmed by that kind of guilt, but also things they can do right now, um, like be aware of apps on their phone. <laughs> but more than that, I mean, more important things like theological training. Sure. Yes, that is a very common thing. You see it all over on blogs and on Facebook. And sometimes social media can make you feel like you're a bad mom or so-and-so does it so much better. And they have these cute pictures. Well, first of all, we have to realize that's not reality. We don't post the pictures that are bad. We delete those immediately. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I took a picture today at church of a little girl who was sweetly playing with a baby doll. And there was a picture just before it that looks like she's about to punch the baby in the face. (laughs) It was not what she was doing. It just looked bad. But it's it's funny. And I showed the parent. But of course, I wouldn't post that one. I mean, we're going to post the cute pictures. And I think that's reality. So we need to be aware of that. Secondly, we all feel that. I mean, I think every mom I know feels mom guilt at some point. I do as well. And I'm deliberate about teaching our children about God and bringing up these conversations or listening and having these conversations. And I fail at it for sure. So we're not going to be perfect parents. We're with our children more than other people besides maybe their teachers. So we need to recognize we're going to mess up. We've never done this before. (laughs) You know, this is new to us. As you said, too, it's not too late. Um, I still call my mom and ask her questions about things, and I'm 40 years old. And, you know, I know that you still contact your dad and ask him things, and that's still okay. We do it even now, but that relationship can start today. So don't feel, um, well, if you feel sad about it, like David said, feel sad, move past that, and then move on. A lot of people will say, well, I don't have enough time. You know, we don't, we're barely, we barely have time to sit down and have dinner. We're running around to soccer and baseball and school and whatever else. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of our conversations happen in the car. Mm -hmm. When we lived in Houston, we had longer trips in the car. But even now where we live in Lawrence, we have, you know, 10 minutes here and there. And many of our conversations happen in the car when things come up. And so you do it when you have time right before bed. Do it during dinner. Just have those conversations that open them up um, for discussion. As far as equipping parents and helping the parents get there, that's a lot of my concern for parents is that I say, I've noticed that parents, I think it's not on purpose that they don't teach their kids about God and biblical principles and what it means to be a Christian. I think oftentimes parents don't because they don't know how. And you have people here to help you. Uh, That's the whole reason that I do a blog called Teaching Kids About God. That's David and I are working on a book together on that. Um, You have children's ministers and youth ministers at churches. And if you found a children's ministry or a youth ministry that is not discipling your children, you know, you don't see things come home or hear things that are what they're learning about, but it's just mm-hmm, fun, mm-hmm. then you need to question where you're going to church. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just about fun. It is about teaching them about God. And like you said, we have an hour, maybe two hours a week. Your kids are at school way more than that, probably playing sports way more than that. So keep that in mind. But one step would be to find a children's ministry or a youth ministry that actually is teaching the Bible. Um, so that would be a big step. Another would be to learn yourself, you know, learn about biblical principles yourself. So go to a church that has good discipleship for adults, that has discipleship groups or Sunday school or life groups or whatever they call it, not just so that you get together and socialize while that's part of it, but also that you're learning biblical principles. Mm-hmm. Um, today at church, I had, I worked with some elementary students and we were working on learning the books of the Bible. And I told them the importance of that and modeled, you know, how to find books quickly in the Bible from my old Bible school days. I mean, Bible drill days. And I spoke with some parents when they came and told them kind of what we're working toward and how that works. And I got some, have some prizes available to the kids. And one of the parents said, oh, I don't know that. And I said, well, you could learn it together. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of it, too. So I've encouraged parents, even who don't read well, to read story Bibles with their children. The picture Bibles that have pictures and Bible stories, a lot of them are pretty true to the meaning of the story. Now, it's going to be paraphrased, and it's oftentimes in kid lingo, but you can learn the gist of it. And then I would say, look up that story in a Bible, you know, without pictures and read it for yourself. So you can learn those stories alongside each other. Um, Choose a Bible verse or two or three or whatever that you could learn together and practice that together. Put it on a 
mirror, post it in the car, put it in their lunchbox, and you learn it in the office. Those kinds of things can help begin that process. Another thing uh, that's that's good. I, I ask my own kids what they've been reading the Bible lately, and if they ask, we'll talk about it. And I always ask the question, "What do you think Paul meant, or Jesus meant, or James meant, or John meant? What do you think the point God is saying in that?" And if they don't, I don't have a clue. Well, then we talk about it. Now, I, I'm a little bit at an advantage with my experience in education. So if you don't have that education experience, that's fine. Then go find a good commentary. That is to say, you know, I don't have a clue. Uh, just go ask your youth minister. Just go ask your children's minister. I would encourage you not to do that. I would encourage you to go look it up yourself. You might need to go talk to your pastor. You might need to go by. In other words, I understand that. But my encouragement is you need to be the means to that end. If possible, let them talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. Let them see you as an authority source for figuring this stuff out. And it's okay to not have all the answers. Who has all the answers? I mean, Jesus, that's it. I mean, nobody does. No, no, None of us do. And we just own that as well. We just we talk to him about it. We we that dialogue process is incredibly important. You can always lead them to some kind of truth about their application, even if you have a minimal understanding. And my encouragement on that side too is obviously you have a biblical studies undergraduate and you have a master of divinity and then you have a PhD in historical theology. I don't have that. I have an undergraduate in elementary studies and a master's degree in school administration. So obviously I have no biblical training as far as um, official school, although I took a New Testament and an Old Testament class. So my learning has come from sitting under pastors and teachers that are good. You're one, you're my favorite and the best uh, one, of course, but also reading my handsome. own and, my, and most handsome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Also reading my own Bible, doing my own study, that sort of thing with failure. I mean, there are times I read it more and times I don't, but just remember that you're not alone in this and you're not, it doesn't matter if you have those advanced degrees, you can start today learning. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and Google's not a good, that's not a scholar. I mean, really, that sink in. If you have a hard time finding the biblical commentaries or books that you don't know where to start, as it were, then send me an email. Mm -hmm. Go to my website and send me an email or contact me on Twitter, and I'll be happy to recommend books whenever you need it. I'm serious about that. There's one that David and I recommend. He showed it to me, and then I've used it and recommended it to parents and to teachers. It's called the Bible Story Handbook. By John Walton, Walton and his and wife, and Kim Walton, Kim Walton. Yeah, John and Kim Walton, the Bible and Story Handbook. It has it's a few pages of each story, some Old Testament, some New Testament, and it breaks it down into what it what you should teach. It's really designed for te- people that teach the Bible, but it's perfect for you because you're teaching the Bible to your children. Hopefully, it tells you what the story was meant to mean and what it was not to, meant to mean, and what to avoid and things like that. And it's really good, so that's a great resource too. Yeah, and to wrap up, I'd like to finish where we started with this gay what? What was it called? Gay Dorado. Gay Dorado, (laughs) which is a pretty funny name. Mm -hmm. I like the name. Uh, (laughs) Well, except for the pictures, two guys kissing and so forth. But anyway, as I said a long time ago, people do ask us, which is great through the years, about how do I talk to my kids about what do I do when these things come out of nowhere and you're kind of blindsided if you're a parent. Some quick tips that we use, and I think they've been so far in life quite successful. And the first thing is, absolutely do your best job as a parent not to freak out when your Mm -hmm. child says something that surprises you. Mm -hmm. Don't have the, I just died face, or I'm about to have a heart attack face, or an anger face, or a disgust face do your best to be pretty robotic like spock or data if you know those are then you're a nerd like me but try to be pretty robotic and dispassionate and stoic when they give their queen you go huh because the more you freak out they will feel that freak out and remember it i can't tell mom because she'll freak out Mm -hmm. now that might be false you might completely disagree and what i mean is you might say that's not fair just because I make a facial expression doesn't mean you can't tell me. And I hear, and you're right. It doesn't really matter what you believe in your, in your heart and mind. They will remember that and are likely to say, I don't want mom to freak out. I won't tell her or dad to freak out. So you have to put on your game face. You have to pretend that what they said is like talking about the weather. Now, it doesn't mean you... <laughs> I'm picturing driving a minivan and they act like a stone-cold eyeballs freeze. I'm not saying act weird. 
all of a sudden you have no facial expression. And my point is you can't freak no. out. You just act normal. You just, you, 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 that's the first tip I'm saying is you've got to get prepared that when this happens, you can't freak out. One of the ways that I try to picture that is if you go to a doctor's office or the ER and you imagine you're bleeding profusely or your arm is broken and twisted all kinds of funny ways, if the doctor freaks out, you're going to freak out. Yeah. But if the doctor is calm when they deliver bad news, it helps you feel calm. <laughs> I have a friend recently that was diagnosed with cancer and thankfully she was able to be treated and mm. has been removed and all that. But she commented on the way that they delivered the news and it was not a good way. Um, and yet I've known other people that have had awesome doctors who have an awesome bedside manner. Those are the ones you want to go to. And so think about that when you're talking to your children. You just, you might need to say, well, let me think about that for a minute. You know, or wow, I'm, I'm surprised. I mean, it's okay to express some emotion. But yeah, if you make like, oh my gosh, what did they just say? Yeah. It's hard. And I've experienced that multiple times when we first moved here. Mm-hmm. And our son went from private school to public school, middle school with 700 kids. Um, he learned all of the slang terms for the body parts and sexual things and Mm -hmm. cuss words, you name it. Anyway. Well, I taught him when he was about three. (laughs) He just forgot. (laughs) He just forgot and it reemerged. Well, as I picked him up each day, because I wasn't working at the time, each day he'd say, mom, what is blank? And there were some days that he asked me things, even though we've talked about a lot of things with him. Um, there were some days he asked me things and I thought, oh my goodness, what did he just say? And how in the world do I respond to that? So sometimes I had to think for a minute, what's the best way to respond? But, you know, you say what's age appropriate. You say, um, sometimes the least thing you can say, the least, the better. How do you say that? Yeah. The less, the better. Maybe. Sometimes the, the less, fewer the words, better. The better yeah. You know, you don't have to go into graphic detail and describe what happens and whatever, but you can give a little minor description of something um it's it's okay to say you know what we'll talk about that a little more as you get older but basically that is blank um so give a little description but you know you don't have to take the sex book out and go through it but just be be aware that you need to give some kind of answer without freaking out yeah so i was laughing not, and obviously not about the cancer but the, the idea of your arm all broken and <laughs> the doctor walks in sweet jesus <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's all twisted up, yeah, funny, twist. like a tree branch. Is everything okay, doctor? I mean, yes, it's great, doing wonderful, and that's what a lot of parents do when they talk about blowjob or they say some other horrible or whatever, and, and much worse. So these games about this and that, they just freak out. So that's mm-hmm. the point. First way is you try your best, take a deep breath, pause, collect your thoughts, and like Elaine said, I think step two is it's okay to give a minimal answer. Now, a minimal answer cannot be ask your dad. <laughs> <laughs> or ask your mom, or we'll talk later and you never talk. The point is, you do give some description. You might need some time to reflect mm-hmm. on. You might know what it means, and that's mm-hmm. okay. You might have to look it up. You might have to look it that's up. Okay. But look it too. up. Because you don't want to be the... If your children know more about all the stuff than you do, you're a horrible guide for them. Mm-hmm. The guide in the wilderness needs to know where the paths are. And so you say, I don't want to look that up. So I think minimal, that's the step thing, is have some kind of response number two. The third thing I'd say is, particularly it's on an issue... A moral issue, and it's different if they say, what's the square root of four, if they, something like that. But when it's a moral issue, which usually why it shocks us, some sexual issue or whatever. The third thing is, I'm begging you, is contextualize that in a Christian worldview. Mm-hmm. Contextualize in a Christian worldview. And what I mean is to say, do not just describe it and go, that's it. What do you want for dinner? Tacos? <laughs> Don't stop there. <laughs> I, and if you're <laughs> hyperventilating <laughs> and you calm down. Let's go to McDonald's. Let's, McDonald's, quick, quick. Uh, here's some ice cream. <laughs> Forget this. Uh, here's a beer. <laughs> uh, oh, or you drink your own beer to calm yourself yeah, down. Especially not while you're driving. <laughs> Mom, why are you, why are you smoking weed? <laughs> Nothing, son. Leave me alone. Ask your father. It's his fault. Uh, you know, um, anyway, where was that? Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. So the contextualized Christianity. You do give some response. You would say, well, that means this, or this is what's going on. And you'd say, remember, in a Christian worldview, now you may not talk that way, but I do. You might say, in Christianity, Christianity teaches, or very much, much better, you would say, remember what Jesus said. Keep it about Jesus as much as possible. Remember Jesus, X, Y, Z. That's really important because when you contextualize it, you allow them to take in the data which is important because that's the real world. You're not trying to bubble them out from existence. Jesus was not living in a bubble Uh -uh. when he preached and died and rose from the dead and is alive today. He's not in a bubble. We shouldn't be either. Uh, Having said that, we should contextualize in a way and unpack it for them as best as possible. 
for example, um, and this is a long story, but I, and I'll say this quickly. In my family, we don't drink alcohol. Well, Jesus drank some alcohol. It probably later rabbinic sources said it was about two fifths watered down, and but nevertheless, it was a form of alcohol, no doubt about it. So, teetotalism that is there's no alcohol whatsoever uh, can't be a Christian virtue because when the founder of your religion drinks alcohol. But we don't for other reasons. But I could. I could drink alcohol and drink wine and whatever I wanted to. Okay. Um, but the point is we don't and for various reasons. When my children see people who drink, and we've talked about through the years, their gut reaction is to say, oh, I can't believe. That is, if they thought a person was Christian, or they might even say, I thought that person was a Christian. Now, for years, we have never, ever, ever said that you, if you drink alcohol, you're not a Christian. And so we laugh about it. We laugh in vexation. We'd be frustrated because we would always contextualize it. We'd always say, you know, Jesus drank, and yeah, you can. The main thing is not to lose self-control and also not to drink because of it's an addiction. That's unhealthy. When you lose self-control, that's something we don't want to have as Christians. We want to be able to love our neighbor as yourself and love God. And we can't love our neighbor as yourself and love God with all of our hearts and being if we're buzzed or if we're drunk. And, and we unpack it more. But my point is that with children, with their own children, they have still, for years, I think now it's a little different. I think you'd agree. When they were younger, it was constantly that way. So when they would be, my point is, that's one example where they'd be shocked seeing someone drink. And no one in our lives, none of their parents, grandparents, nobody told them this stuff was all or nothing, but it was shocking to them. And then we would contextualize it. Whether it be sexuality, we've talked a lot about sexuality with our kids on and off, or smoking drugs, or murder, or shootings in the schools, whatever it might be, we just try to contextualize it. And and that's very important because, if, if I may say, I've said this on the podcast, I have a deep empathy for this. Many, well... Every Christian I've heard of that's left Christianity, left fundamentalism, their parents were legalistic. They thought that if you just do all the right rules, they were told science was bad. They didn't read the Bible well. They asked these kind of questions. They told them just to have faith. or that's just, They would just say, that's just bad. That's just bad. And that's what we don't want to happen, right? I mean, as parents, we don't want our kids to abandon the faith. Not to mention a false understanding of faith. And I do argue false, and I'm not going to argue that it's false right now, but I'm convinced it's false. Instead, we're going back to Jesus and contextualize it. So what we don't say is, it doesn't matter, it's okay, we don't want to hurt your feelings. That's false. We also don't want to say, that's just bad, shut up and move on. That's false too. Or that they need to go tell all their friends that everything is bad and, it's, you know, yeah, be it's a, your a job. Attitude. Next time you're that... That transsexual, bi, pantheistic, pansexual roommate at school. You tell them. You yeah. tell them when I, next time you tell them, you're going to hell. And then, oh my goodness. No, we teach them you love your That's neighbor as yourself. Stupid. You don't may not agree Absolutely. with the behavior, but you love the person and you're kind to the person. And they've asked that for, what do I do? What do I say? I say, you right. what would you do to your best friend? Mm-hmm. And they start giggling. What would you do? Well, they say, oh, I guess that'd be nice to them. Well, they could be nice to them. Mm-hmm. What in the world? You're 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 not the judge and jury of outside world. That's that's not your job anyway. Don't. Oh my goodness. But the point is, we contextualize it, and then the, we give stories. When Jesus was forced to those same questions, here's what he did, and so forth. So those are the quick three things I want to uh, encourage you. And oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. There are also things in Christianity that are black and white. When it comes to sexuality, you know, Jesus taught you it's a man and a woman. They marry. And the idea is you have sexual relations when they're married. The New Testament teaching, you have sex inside of marriage. Anything outside of marriage is off limits for Christians. So that means, you know, if you're living together and having sex, if it's a boyfriend and girlfriend they're having sex, if it's two women, two men, whatever it is, if it's outside of marriage, it's not, that's not the way God designed it to be. It's okay to tell your children that. And it's appropriate to tell your children that. Right. So, you know, when I brought up the beginning about the whole gay Dorado Part of it is because it's bringing up homosexuality and promoting it and whatever. Part of, for me, even more than homosexuality, though, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's sexuality, that it's pushing our children, it's making okay, making it okay and appropriate for our children to hear, oh, well, if you have tendency to be attracted toward men or toward women or toward everybody or toward nobody or toward, you know, you feel like you're this or you feel like you're that, you do it. That's not what the Bible teaches. So where some things are not, you know, as black and white necessarily, we choose not to drink. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says not to be drunk and it says things like that. We we don't want to be what 
Paul calls a stumbling block for people. There are reasons we do. We choose not to do that. But we know plenty. Almost everybody we know drinks to a certain degree. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, but there's still a lot of them are Christians. Nevertheless, so that's one of those areas where, you know, we tell our children what, what David said. On the other side, we also teach our children, which society totally does not teach, is that sex is reserved inside of a marriage for a man and a woman. And so when that's brought up over and over and over on TV, on shows, commercials, apps, whatever, it, ads, um, we need to be aware of that. And we still teach sexuality is designed inside of marriage for a man and a woman. So when those things come up, that's a perfect opportunity to bring it up. You know, you mentioned a term earlier. <laughs> I say it. <laughs> He mentioned the term blowjob earlier. Well, inside a marriage, totally different thing. I would describe that very briefly of what maybe I would. I, how do I say that? I would describe that very briefly what it was in an age appropriate way. Not fully, <laughs> not draw a picture or show them a video. No, if they asked me that, I would describe it briefly. But I would say when a man and woman are married, they might show they love each other by doing sexual things in the end. So, right, anyway. when they're younger, when they get older, we call this is called oral sex, yeah. and oral sex is called fellatio mm-hmm. and called yeah. conolingus. And as I start giving technical names for right. it and say, yeah, it's a form of it's a form of sexual expression inside of a marriage. Right. And what's key here to what I maybe hear you implying is in these different issues, for example, the, in these two we keep bringing up, and this just happens to be these two because we brought them up <laughs> drinking anything, and sexuality, yeah. we're able to articulate our convictions on these issues. We, what we don't say is, I don't know, just 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 don't do it. I mean, that's just not the best answer to give your children. We also it, don't say, when a man and woman love each other, then they... Because that's not it. It's not about loving each other. It's about being married. Mar- that's right. So love that's what they hear in movies and TV and whatever. That's when right. you love each other, you do whatever you want. That's, what that's sex not is. what it's designed it. to be. That's right. No sexuality. In fact, if you use Paul's instruction to Timothy, you treat women like your sisters and older women like your moms. So whatever you do with your sister, <laughs> Gross. there you go. And some guys are like, yes. <laughs> That's disgusting. Well, some guys are. <laughs> but most people find that pretty repulsive. Yeah, that's, on the, that's the purpose. So we try not to freak out. We try to give some kind of mental response as much as possible. If you don't know what it is, go find out. And three, you contextualize it inside of a Christian worldview. And of course you do it within a Christian worldview. And I'm trying to and I, I, I re-em, re-em, re-emphasize that one more time because... These are Christian ethics. Sexuality, drinking, lying, gossip. These are Christian ethics. Now, non-Christians might concur with them. Fine. But I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not an atheist. I'm saying it within the Christian worldview. And my point of that is very explicit. I say this to our children. The person in your classroom, the person on that app, the person on social media, you are not here to make sure they obey or follow Christian ethics. You don't know if they're a Christian. But you know you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. So it is within a Christian worldview that I gave these answers, not without of one. So there's nothing wrong. Don't be ashamed to talk about what Christians believe. If you know this is a hot topic with which there are various views that are legitimate, well, then you can talk about the different views. But it's okay for you to have a view and articulate what that view is. Another thing that we bring up with our children on a regular basis is that this is not a popular view. As you were saying, a Christian right, worldview, right. it's not right. popular. So when you say... We prepare them for that. Right. So when we were growing up, it might have been a little different. Back in, you know, the 50s, it was different. Now we're in 2018, and so they need to expect that. When they're choosing to not do sexual things until they're married to the person of the opposite gender, that is not a popular worldview. They will be teased for that. They will be made fun of for that. That will come along. They will be the minority, so be prepared for that. And it doesn't mean they have to tell everybody else unless they choose to, but at the same time to not be ashamed of it. We are Christians and that's part of what we choose to do. And there's a reason for it. We were, as Christians, we have promised, as Jesus wanted us to do, to take up our cross daily and follow him. That means sacrifice. And some of our sacrifices because we love Jesus, well, hopefully all of our sacrifices because we love Jesus and want to do what he taught. And so that means sometimes we don't do what we want to. So as we wrap up, we'll just wrap up here and just say, I I feel compelled to say it one more time. All these ethical issues in the Christian worldview can be contextualized, should be contextualized, should be talked about, should be addressed, should not be freaked out about around the, in the family, 
even if it's just your single mom, single dad, you're it. You're the great resource for them. And that is amazing when they feel the safety to go to you and ask these kinds of questions, these kind of comments. And I'm, I forgot to, I should have said this to you a long time ago, which is the sense of don't freak out. I, I meant to say also, like you said earlier, praise your children when they talk about it. Every mm-hmm. single time they ask you a question about anything that might seem hard for them to have done it, thank them for it. Mm-hmm. Say, thank you so much for telling me that. It's wonderful. That's a good question. And I've had our children many times talk about stuff like this. And they'll say, Dad, I know it's kind of weird, but I'm so glad I can go to you, both our mm-hmm. son and daughter. I'll say, I'm, you are always safe. Give them a hug and kiss. You are always safe to come to me. And I'm so glad you did. Mm-hmm. That's courageous. And you're, I'm, I'm the one person, me and your mama. Well, not your mama, but me. I'm the one person. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're the, we're the people the rest of your entire lives, at least, that you can always trust to be a safe place for you, to try to figure this stuff out with you. We're here for you. And we don't have all the answers, but we love you so much. We're alongside you. And that's incredible. And that that mixed with that data is going to equip them very much so. And so they don't feel like they go to their, their classmate and say, you're a sinner and you're whatever. They don't feel that need anymore. They don't feel scared anymore. They go, I, if, I have, if I come across something I don't understand, I'll talk about mom and dad or aunt and uncle or, or your caretaker or whatever. I'll, I'll talk to so-and-so. That's good. And they'll help me understand it. And that's a good deal. It also helps them to feel empowered. They may never tell you this, but when they go in equipped for a conversation or hear kids talk about something and they know what it means and sometimes they even know yeah. more accurately what it means than what they than what they um, what the others do, they'll feel more equipped, they'll feel more powerful and you're helping them to make better decisions down the road. So by educating them, you're giving them power, giving them the choice. Um, to do what they think Jesus would do, which hopefully is what they'll choose, but they always have the option to go the other way. But no one then can say that we didn't help them. Yeah, that happens often with hate when it comes to other world religions. We've talked so much about Islam and Mormonism or whatever it is, or atheism, and it's amazing how much has been used in his, I mean, at the cafeteria. He'll come home and say, they said so-and-so, that's not true at all. And it, it is it is true that those kids say some dumb things. That is in, uninformed. They really don't know. They've... I mean, it's amazing. And it, well, now I have to tell this anecdote. Remember, he was sitting around with the kids one time, and they were. This is early in the year. This is last year, and they were going to form clubs. And he heard these kids saying they're going to form a what was it, an anti-gay club, something like that. And he looked at them crazy, and they said, "He said, what? Why would you do that?" And he said, "Because that's we're Christians. That's what Christians do. We're against mm-hmm. the gays." And I'm praise Jesus. He said, "No, we're not." <laughs> he said, "We don't form clubs of the anti-gay club." And they go, "Yeah." And he goes, "No, that's not. We're, <laughs> mm-hmm. we're not against the people. Come on." But I, I was so proud. I was so glad that I thought, "Yes, yeah, win for us," but also win for him to. Yeah. But they were just serious. I thought it was like he, I said they weren't kidding. He said, "No, Dad, they were serious. They wanted to form and." Anyway, that kind of stuff. So praise God, he knew had some knowledge about him to say, "No, we don't go out of our way to." This is. Anyway. And now he has a friendship with a little kid who's a more who's a Muslim. Muslim. Yeah, yeah. That he he plays video games with them and talks to him at school and I talk saw about him one Jesus, day his throwing faith. snowballs at each other and they mm-hmm. talk about faith and that's really cool because he knows a little bit more about it. So that's empowered him to have mm-hmm. a friendship with a kid who doesn't believe the same as he does. Now, are we gonna do this right all the time? No way. Are we gonna fail? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Do have we failed ourselves, maybe sexually or we haven't kept to Jesus commandments or whatever? Absolutely. Do we talk about ourselves in the third person? Yes. Do we, <laughs> do we like ask to do ourselves that? questions? Yes. yes, we do. Do we always give answers to our questions? <laughs> Probably so. That ain't right. <laughs> do you want to keep hearing this? No, you don't. <laughs> My point is don't <laughs> let your past failures <laughs> or your current failures keep you from teaching your kids the right way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Good answer, Sonny. Uh, I agree with about 10% of that. So God bless you. Thanks a lot. See you next time. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen more. If you want more, go to davidpendergrass.com. There are tabs at the top that let you have access to all the podcasts I've recorded, to sermons I've done, uh, books I've written. They're all there at davidpendergrass.com. You can also check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom. And also look at my Twitter feed at glimpse the king or at Dr. D Pendergrass at Dr. D Pendergrass. There are tons of ways reached out. I hope you will send me your questions, send me your comments. 
If you'd like to support the ministries of Glimpse of the Kingdom, you can also find ways to give online on davidpendergrass.com. If you'd like for me to come and do some consulting, check out my website, davidpendergrassconsulting.com, and I'll be happy to come out and speak to your organization and help and train any way I can. God bless you. See you online.